Welcome to a Remote Ruby Game Show Edition. Huh? What do you think? Chris, are you there? This seems pretty great. Just yeah. talking to myself. I found that on YouTube. That's pretty good. Let's just do it again. That's professional. It's the only one I knew I could use without, like, copyright infringement. Come on down. It's good. Oh, that's <sighs> great. It does feel like, uh, you know, I'm on a game show this week. I like it. You are on a game show this week. What are so we've prizes? T- that's what I'm most interested in. Uh, the respect <laughs> and love of your peers and listeners. I'll take it. I, I, that I can live with. <laughs> uh there i've put together 30 questions uh so basically i uh don't get any like smooth ideas since i'll be asking all the questions but i basically just opened up wikipedia and like went to ruby and went through stuff and then somebody like five or six years ago had a github that was like ruby trivia so i I snagged a few that i thought were still current off that one nice nice also, I'm sick, so I sound like. Oh man! If it sounds like sick? snots pouring out of my face, that's because that's what's happening. <laughs> Hold on. How long you been sick? I had to mute while I sneezed. Uh, I've been sick four days. Oh well, hopefully it wraps up then uh, before before Christmas, man. Yeah, I so I like I have sleep apnea. And I sleep with a CPAP mask, and it broke the other night. Ooh. And so, like, uh, I tried to wear it anyway because I can't sleep without it. So, like, half my mask was open, and yeah. like, I think, and I was sick after that. So, I don't know if. Uh, yeah, huh? Just that's no fun. Living the dream, but uh, so we talked with Brittany last week, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, one thing she she suggested to us uh, afterwards when we were chatting was that she uh, she actually listens to the show. She would like if we would kind of like recap our weeks, like give updates. So I thought we'd start with that and start with you. What's yeah. been going on? Yeah, man. Um, this week I've been doing a bunch of work on the the page M. I got um, a bunch of the the brain tree um, stuff refactored, and I added all the webhooks for things um so we've been making good progress on that and it's starting to really wrap up nicely which um will then i will once that's kind of situated which it may be right now um i'm gonna dive into uh to finishing up the payments with rails course i already updated um all of the stripe stuff on there so if anybody's interested in the latest version of Stripe and and the uh, payments course for that, I've got it on courses.gorails.com, proudly hosted by yours truly on Podia. Woo! Yeah, I love Podia, man. It's it's just like really easy. I just upload files and then I'm done. And it's like there's nothing else to it. <laughs> it's kind of awesome. I so, love Podia too. Yeah. I think it's cool, and all you guys are fantastic. Um, I don't know everybody that works there, but uh, I knew you know half of you guys at this point or something, and you're all fantastic. So I can only imagine everybody else's too. Oh yeah, good no, team. All my coworkers are great. That's good. Yeah, you know, having a great little team like that is, you know, makes a job so much more enjoyable. You know. Yes, very much so. So, yeah, that's that's about all for me. Just kind of getting stuff uh, situated before um, before Christmas, because you know, probably end up traveling a few days in there. So, not a whole lot will get done in the meantime. Um, yeah, how about you? What have you been working on? Who? What have I been working on this week? Uh, so mostly kind of getting winding down the year. So I don't think I really pushed a lot of like big changes at work recently, but I have a couple of things that are kind of big, like some performance refactoring, things like that. Uh, But we're not deploying that until 2019. So like basically I'm like ramping down and like opening up PRs and I have a, I have a beautiful little green 2019 label. I'm stamping on them and nice. Yeah. Uh, Excuse me. 
It's crazy how soon 2019 will be here. It's like, you know, yeah, it's, what? Two, it's two weeks like, away? One week? We leave tomorrow for Nashville for a few days to go see my wife's family. And I'm like, man, why are we going out of town? And I'm like, oh, Christmas is like a few days away. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of snuck up on me because it feels like Thanksgiving was last week, but it turns out that's not really not really the case. I must live in a, a, a time warp bubble here or something. Is that like a St. Louis thing? Yeah, or maybe it's just a working from home thing. <laughs> Dude, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. I went to lunch with a friend today and he was like, you know, some of us, like he was telling me he had to go somewhere after work. He's like, I just took lunch. I took dinner with me. Like I picked it up on the way. He's like, cause some of us don't just work from our houses all day. And I was like, come on. <laughs> yeah. I'm like the only time that I get out of the house some days is to go eat, you know? <laughs> so yeah, like, it, it's either food or the doctor. I, some reason, <laughs> I some reason go to the doctor a lot, I guess, because I like my insurance so much. But hey, it's uh, it's important. Um, it. Yeah, uh, I was going to mention thinking more about the the pay gem that we got. Um, one of the things that like uh, came to mind last week as I was working on it. Um, are you familiar with the Stripe Ruby Mock gem? I am. I'm actually about to have to wrestle with it. Oh, yeah? So, yeah, we're, we're having some trouble with we paralyzed our test suite in Heroku. Oh, is the mocks not? Uh... There's a couple of times, like, we expect something to be true and it's false. And it uh. always goes back to these, like, Stripe requests. Huh. So, I hope you're not about to, like, talk about how much you love it because I'm just over here like, ah, no, no, I, I, it's reasonably good, but the problem is it's trying to mimic the real Stripe API. And in order to mimic that 100%, you actually have to implement the real Stripe API and, you know, a bunch of those features because they deprecate things and whatever, you know. So then it's like, well, this gem can never really be that great. Um, and so I'm using that right now for... Uh, we're using that for the page gem for the stripe portion. You can say you, I haven't touched it at all. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, that, that's been like what we're using for that. But then, you know, bring trees gem doesn't have any sort of equivalent. And so what I ended up doing was just testing against their sandbox, you know, live. And then um, uh, I pulled in the VCR gem, which like, it's just so easy to use. It's kind of ridiculous. Shout out VCR. We use that at, we actually use that at my last job for Braintree specs. Oh, really? Yeah. That's there you go. Exactly what we used it for. <laughs> That's hilarious. Cause yeah, I, I like was sitting down and I was like, man, you know, I don't want to try and dive into their library too much and, and like build my own mocks or anything. And VCR is really just, the greatest little thing to record the JSON response into a file. And then, you know, I'm not entirely sure how it does that with web mock. Um, but it's awesome. Cause you know, I don't have any idea what library I, I knew that they were using that, uh, HTTP, I think for making the requests. So all I had to do was tell VCR use web mock web mock, just knew to, you know, integrate with net SSH. I didn't have to configure anything. And then voila, you know, the Braintree gem now hits our files instead of the actual API. And it's just so nice to be able to be like, okay, I've been working on these tests with against the real API for a little while. I know they um, work correctly and they're a little slow because they hit real API requests. And then you turn on VCR and you're like, boom, write some files next time around those are super fast and if the response object from braintree changes uh, we can just delete the file and redo it and that's really cool the downside of course being that you don't know when those uh, api changes happen because you've recorded you'll find out qu quick enough yeah when production breaks somebody will go make a payment it'll fail miserably 30 times <laughs> yeah i there's got to be a better way of, you know, doing that 
in your test suite or your CI or something like, you know, delete those files after a week or something. It'd be kind of cool if those files expired. So like your test suite every once in a while it would be completely cleared out and use and use the latest um, responses. It'd be kind of neat. You could like, it may have this built in functionality. I have no idea. You could always like uh, read the file and be like, was this created more than a week ago? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I, don't I don't know if that's a feature or not, but it seems kind of like an obvious one. If not, maybe yeah, we should have cool. it. would be cool. The other thing, like you mentioned, like it seems like it, you know, there should be a way to be able to do this like testing. But like that's kind of the problem with like using like mock libraries too, right? Is that if the API changes, yeah, exactly. You have to rely on the mock to update. So like, mm-hmm. and that's why you see in the um, uh, I forget what library it is now, um, the one where it's like when you create a mock, you have to define exactly uh, what method it expects to be called on it, and then you know what response and all that stuff. That way you're kind of like making it more explicit, but then it's still not, it's still not great because you like, you pretty much never want to mock things if you don't have to, because uh, they are very prone to break and your test will just be, you know, happily passing, even though your code does not. Yeah. Um, I will say though, like the Stripe, Ruby mock library uh, is one of the, like of all the libraries I've used like that is one of the slickest ones. Like it works pretty well. The problem, yeah, the problem we really have, does. I think is something with like transactions and like multi-process testing. Mm, yeah. I like a know. thread safety thing or something. Something. Yeah. But yeah. Also, well, I mean, that's a very complicated gem too. Cause it, doesn't it also start up its own server where you can have it set up where it, you know, boots in a whole other process that you hit as the fake API? Like it's a complicated mock system for uh Stripe, but it for the most part, like I've had very, very good luck with it. There was just a few times where I was like, well, I'm depending on this one feature of Stripe. And I was trying to confirm that, you know, the results would include this thing. And, you know, Stripe Ruby Mock didn't have that feature in it yet. And so luckily it's like fairly easy to go add that stuff in or just kind of, you know, deal with it um, and just assume that that stuff's going to work because you know which version of the Stripe API you're on or whatever. I'm kind of diverging a little bit like from what we're talking about today, but on the subject of like parallel testing, uh, I, so we use Heroku and we have like 16 processes that like split across using Knapsack. Okay. Heroku now supports up to 32 processes. Oh, wow. That's great. It's, a, it's in a private beta. I, one of my friends who works at Heroku, I messaged him and I was like, Heroku now offers 1,024 dynos. Please message us for availability. Huh. What's the... Oh, uh, I was like, what's... I was like... What is that? A gig of RAM? Like, <laughs> no, it's it's limited to thirty two dinos. But like, I was like, they just keep increasing it. Like, yeah, that's so awesome though. Um, and then, will you be able to get rid of Knapsack when Rails six drops? Because isn't it going to have parallel testing built in or something? The answer is, huh? Maybe I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know how. I'm a, I'm assuming it has a pretty decent like backwards compatibility story, and like we keep our Rails app up to date. But I, I don't know, I don't know enough about it to say one way or the other. Yeah, I haven't looked into it much either. So, Knapsack yeah. Pro is cool because like it basically just creates a queue of all your spec files, and then as one finishes, it like hits their server and it's like, all right, what's my next one? What's my next one? You say Knapsack Pro? Yes. <clears throat> so is it like a sidekick pro kind of it thing? is so so we oh, actually nice. like we we pay for this functionality and 
like the way it works without pro I, there's some other features but like if i remember correctly it's been a while since i set it up without pro like you have to run a script or like run a command anytime you like add a new spec file or something like that so it knows how to divvy them up for like the number of processes mm. or you pay monthly for the professional license and so like we have 16 heroku test instances ci instances and so each one like hits this knapsack endpoint as like what test should I run? And it tells them and like pops it off the queue. So that's how like we don't have like conflicting tests running or anything like that. Yeah. Huh. And it's nice because if like one let's say like one dyno is like just rocking, like knocking out tests, it's not like it's getting pretty divided evenly. So like if we had thirty two, it's just gonna be like which ones can I grab? So, I don't know. Pretty cool. Dude, that's great. I I love these, you know, little businesses that are uh, focused and targeted like that. That's fantastic. Um, you know, we, we need more of this stuff. We've talked about it many times, but more Sidekick Pros. We need similar products. And that way we can have better tools. The world needs more Mike Params. Yeah, exactly. Well, cool. that's eight, awesome. I'll have to check that out then uh, sometime. Hmm. Anything else you want to chat about before we dive in? Oh, well, I was just going to mention the Action Mailbox announcement. That was kind of interesting. I didn't really expect a you know inbound email feature to be coming out, but that's super cool. But it does really tie into core features of Basecamp that they're extracting, like action text and um they they already had that feature of in, inbound email so super cool to see that griddler um will probably end up kind of getting uh replaced by action text unless you know it is very likely that griddler having been around for a lot longer will be still a lot more flexible for a while until uh, a year or two in, just like active storage is it's good and all, but it's got its downsides because no you know, doubt it's got the base camp uh version that's worked works good for them, but not necessarily for everyone else. So, you know, these other gems that exist still have their place in the world just because they don't necessarily need or want to work the same way that base camp wants things to work. Um, you know, and so that's 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 good, but eventually I think this stuff is great to have in the framework itself so you have a baseline to work off of and go from there. It's just good to have those features. So I'm excited about that. I've been doing Griddler on... I built, stupidly, my uh, own little ticketing system for Hatchbox, which has gotcha. been great. It's been great. But, um, you know, using Griddler, there's a bunch of little uh, odds and ends that happen, like sometimes a whole email will just be blank when it imports. I don't exactly know where that came from. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And there's a few other things too, that I think, um, I think action text will probably take care of. Like, you know, if you, if someone embeds an email or an image into an email um, with Griddler, it shows up like as an attachment. And then there's like some text placeholder that you have to find and replace with a, your own image tag or something. And hopefully that'll be more automatic with action text and, and stuff, but it's not too big of a deal uh, as it is, but kind of nice to see the way that that might be able to work very seamlessly in, in rails as a default sort of framework, I guess. Yeah, we will see. We talked before. Okay. But last thing we've talked before about like, you know, we have these, uh, abstractions or th things that get actually extracted out of Basecamp into Rails. Do you think Rails uses devise or do you think they use like the uh, has secure user or whatever? Uh, you mean Basecamp? Yeah. They, that's what uh, they have their own uh, and, and it's a single sign on. Um, so oh, that's right. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah, it's like launchpad dot basecamp or launch. Maybe it's still launchpad dot thirty seven signals dot com. Um, but yeah, it's like 
their single sign on thing, which I know, uh, having seen one of the episodes that DHH posted on YouTube, um, he talked about one of the features for, for logging in or something. And that, that was like all custom. Um, but yeah, it probably does use has secure password or something like it for the actual, uh, login part. Cool. That was just, uh, a side thought. All right. So, uh, are you ready? All right, let's do this. I can't prepare today. Um, so I have 30 questions, mostly not my own questions, just from the internet. Uh, and I shouldn't cheat by opening Wikipedia, all right? You could cheat if you want. I don't really care. <laughs> I figure what we'll do. Uh, if I have word for word the exact answer, then you'll know I'm cheating. These are all like one word answers. So oh, okay. okay. They're, I feel like they're pretty like uh, low hanging fruit questions, but it'd be kind of fun. I will. I figure this would be fun if I ask you a question. We sit on it for a second so those listening can think about it. And then you try and answer, and I will tell you if it's right or wrong. All right. Does that sound good? Yep. Works right, for let me, me. Let me pause real quick so I can cough. <laughs> I'm back. Oh, man. Hopefully, you'll be better soon. It's going to be a, a long day. All right. So, let's get started. According to Matt, what year was Ruby conceived? Um, I think it came out in 95, so maybe it was conceived 93, something like that. That's correct. Ooh. So that leads into question number two. In what year was Ruby first released? <laughs> mm. All right. Go ahead and say it. 1995. Did it say what month? Was it early or late in the year? Uh, I don't remember. I just I figured year would be easier. Yeah, I was just curious. So this is a fun one I didn't know. Question number three. There were two potential names for the language. In the end, Ruby was the name chosen. Chosen. What was the other proposed name? You know, I'm not sure. I I, can't, I vaguely remember hearing something or reading something about this a long, long time ago, and I have no idea. Coral. Coral. C O R A L. I being from the south, I was like, oh, corral. <laughs> Golden Corral. Golden Corral. <laughs> no, I thought that was fascinating. I didn't know that one. Yeah, that's interesting. I like it. It's a nice, it's a nice name, and it immediately reminded me of Crystal, which is same. same. You know, same syntax, more or less. So that's pretty funny. They could have. That's what they could have done. Is they could have stolen cor Coral. I almost said Corral. <laughs> <laughs> Missed opportunity. Yeah. There you go. All right. Question number four. What was the first book written in English about Ruby? <laughs> Copyright infringement. Man, I don't know that one. So it, no it is programming Ruby. Okay. Who wrote that? Uh, I think that's like the pickaxe, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it'd be Dave Thomas. Yeah. I that's what it said that was the first book in English according to that's Wikipedia, cool. which wonder when that came out. How how long after the language? Let's find out. Because I know I know my source. <laughs> yeah. Huh. I, I it makes perfect sense. That's like a great title for it. So I donated four dollars to Wikipedia this year. So. That's like that's like if you were smart enough to get RailsTutorial dot org before everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good old Michael Hartle. Let's see here. 
do, do, do. Um, I, don't, I don't remember if I've even read uh, the pickaxe book. I know it's highly recommended. I just have read mostly, you know, the the Ruby docs personally. It was one. Of, I think Eloquent Ruby was the first book I read on Ruby. I have the pickaxe. Avdi's book, Eloquent Ruby. Do what? Who wrote the Eloquent Ruby? Russ Olson, I think. Oh, okay. Isn't there an... Did, does Avdi have a book that was Eloquent something? Maybe not. Might be just... He has a book, I think, Exceptional Ruby, maybe? Exceptional. That's what it was. It's about like handling exceptions. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. In September 2000, the first English language book, Programming Ruby, was printed. 2000. Wow. So, it took five years or so before there was an English book on Ruby. That's fascinating. In 97, huh. the first article about Ruby was published on the web. 97? Oh. Yeah. The first article? That's weird. Like, you know, like two years afterwards? That's slow. It says like, Matt's was hired are... by netlabjp.jp to work on Ruby as a full-time developer. Huh. Man, that's interesting because, like, you know, that's the, these days we'd be like, oh, that's a ridiculous amount of time for something to you know, start a language and then try and get it out there. Um, but things take a lot longer than you think they do a lot of times. Yeah. While we're here, it says that 98 was when the simple English language homepage for Ruby was launched. Huh. And my favorite version of Windows. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> now, Windows Millennial edi- or Millennium Edition was the Give best. Me. <laughs> all right yeah. so all right we have we've done a good job getting off the little track there no this trivia is fun though all right softball you ready all right let's do it in what year did the popular ruby web framework ruby on rails first appear Was it 2001? Hmm. Actually, now I don't trust my source. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can live tweet DHH, and we'll, this episode will be as long as it takes for him to respond. <laughs> <laughs> we will sit here for hours. <laughs> okay. No, it looks like I was. I got it. <laughs> 2005 was the initial release. 2005. Okay. It's what I had in my notes, but then I remember I just did that one. Oh no, what's happened? Hit the wrong button. Uh, that, that was in my notes, but I did that one off memory, so I doubted myself. Yeah. Yeah, I don't... I was not around uh, Ruby at all in the early days, so... I think I joined right as 2.3 was becoming 3, and Bundler was being added and stuff, so... Yeah, I, you know what we should do? Maybe I'll make an episode of Go Rails on we'll build a Rails app using Rails like 1.0. Dude, that'd be <laughs> or what, awesome. Or whatever's like or the first version published on Ruby Gems that's still there, which might be like a earlier one. I'm going to have to see this. Dude, that's a cool idea. That would be fun. And then we could also do it for April Fool's and then it's like pretend that it's a brand new one. Yeah, here. Well, interesting. So you said, oh, uh, maybe 1.0 is 2005. Yeah. Because there's Ruby Gems has 0.8, which goes back to October 25th, 2004. Huh. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the first official full release was December 13th, 2005. So, yeah, that's what I was going on uh, from DuckDuckGo. yeah, I would I would count that as the first version. Um, well, let's look at my question. Looks like there was a bunch of you know pre releases. It looks like so. Yeah, makes sense. I feel like we need a we need a Rails historian here, but I feel like it was worked on, but it wasn't released like or like presented to the world until two thousand five. Yeah, very much could be. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to to hear more about the early days because I don't really understand what all happened when Merb was merged in. And like I know there was a lot of people that were very vocal about this and that. And 
you know, I'd be really curious to see you. We are used to this version of Rails, like a two, I think was when that happened or something. I don't remember, but you know, we're using Rails, which is like a combination of these two frameworks now that uh, may be very different from Rails one or whatever. I don't, I don't know exactly when that happened, but we need to I'd get be really Huda on. That. Yeah, there you go. What's he working on these days? Mostly JavaScript stuff. That, like. I don't know. I haven't heard as much like open source stuff that he's doing. I'm sure they're really busy at Tilda yeah. doing Skylight and stuff, but working in Rust. Yeah, there you go. All right. We got a lot more questions. On what day is a new version? Let me rephrase this question. On what day is the new version of Ruby typically released each year? This would be like a stable zero release. Christmas Day. Woo! Man, and this year we get a just-in-time compiler, which is pretty interesting. And no Rails benefits yet, but... The next time we record, our guests yeah. will know a lot about that. Yeah, no kidding. He had a great talk, uh at Southeast Ruby. I really like that. What version of Ruby unified fixed num and big num classes into the integer class? Mm, I'm going to have to guess on this one, but uh, 2.0? 2.4, you were close. I uh, yeah, I kind I had a sl small hunch that it was later than I thought, but yeah. Just for the record, I didn't know most of these, so they're completely unfair questions for me to ask. Hey, I have a I have a trivia question for you. Oh yeah. What? what I'm listening. What? What Rails version came between 5.0 beta four and 5.0 RC one? What was the which Rails Rails five? Yeah, so it was. It looks race, like it was, it was the race car edition, right? Yeah, there you go. You got it. Yeah, there's Rails five beta four, five race car one, and then five RC one the same day. I just remember how <laughs> absurd it was. Yeah, I'd never noticed that before. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What version of Ruby introduced keyword arguments? Man, I'm not going to know any of these. Was it 2.2? 2. 2? 2. It was 2.0. 2.0? 2. 2. I couldn't remember. I couldn't I remember. Th I knew that like the hash syntax changed. But then I couldn't remember if they added that. I know there was a lot of talk about is this a good idea or not for the argument or function keywords. Well, I only have three more questions like this. So buckle up. Mm -mm. What version of Ruby introduced the safe navigation operator? I'm not going to know this one either. I'd uh, say two, three. Got it. Nice. And that's the, I, I honestly don't use that. I never even, it never even crosses my mind that it's still a thing to use. Uh, Neither do keyword arguments. I always forget them. We use. Uh, uh, that's the ampersand dot. Yeah. Thing, right? It basically like replaces the rails. Try uh -huh. it's like built into Ruby. The only like, reason i remember to use it is because rubocop will be like oh you could do this here and i'm like yes i could thank you rubocop yeah that's nice yeah that's a good a good thing we just got finished uh what's his name jesper um and i were working on the page m converting it over to keyword arguments so we were running into you know some related things there 
but I was like, man, I haven't used these on my own in my own code for uh, quite a while. I, like, I kind of feel bad. I I'm like keyword arguments. I think they're really handy. Like there was something I was doing in there that was like, oh, this is really nice. Like it improves this quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I was like, man, I got to start using this more often. I just have my, you know, Ruby 1.93 habits. Uh, luckily, I don't use the old hash syntax. It's super long, but uh, I still kind of code in that style <laughs> out of habit. <laughs> Sorry, I was losing my all my lungs over here. <laughs> what version of Ruby introduced the ability to use colons for symbol keys alongside the old hash syntax? Two point oh. One nine. Oh. Yeah, I guess you're right. I, I, you know, when I was answering that, I was like, I bet you each of these questions has a different Ruby version number, and I've already used 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> you are actually yeah, right. I each one right. is different. I think uh, everybody was very, very hesitant on 1.9 to use that syntax because there were so many hosting providers and everything that were using the old uh Ruby, and so you like didn't want to ever write that syntax in your gems or anything because you wanted your code still to work on one eight one eight five or something, uh, whatever the last version of that was. That makes. I can probably give you a Hatchbox. Hatchbox gave me a trivia idea for you as well. I'm listening. Um, I'm gonna have to look this up real quick, but there was. At some point, you remember those old Ruby versions that would have the um, the patch version at the end? It was like 1.93-P587 or whatever. Yes, I remember that. At one point, they actually got rid of that. And I, I don't even remember when this is. So I, I'm, this is going to be the worst trivia question you've ever heard. Uh, but yeah, it was like Ruby 2.1 or something where they adopted like actual semantic versioning and got rid of the patch versions and just made them uh, actual small versions like 2.1, I think was what it was. If I pull up the Hatchbox code, I have an exception in there because some people would specify it without and then like RBN would blow up because it was like well you didn't say the exact patch version and uh yeah it got to be kind of annoying supporting those old versions there because it was like very strict about the formatting and then i think the well i can't even pull this code up here well, let's see real fast uh deploy the we'll deploy script here is oh wrong one. <clears throat> Let's see, here we go. Yeah, two point one. So up to two point oh, there was patch version six forty eight. One nine three was patch five five one and one eight seven. And I don't even support any of the the lower versions for those are so old that it's like if you're not if you're running Ruby one nine three or one eight seven and you're not using the latest versions, you should. They're way too old. I didn't even <laughs> think about that. Like I remember exactly what you're talking about because I came in one nine three and I remember like crazy patch versions and right they just like disappeared. And I didn't think anything of it. Yeah, I had forgotten all about them, and then it wasn't until somebody was like, "Hey, I'm deploying a you know a legacy app on Hatchbox." And like, it doesn't work. And I was like, oh, also, this is really weird. <laughs> and then I would put in, you know, some people would just put in uh, their Ruby version as 193, which would be fine for all the newer versions. But you actually were required, I think, with RBM or something to do the dash P551 on the version number. So I actually go in there and check and see if you put 193 or 187 or 2.0 and actually include the latest patch version for each of those so you don't have to it's kind of weird 
like fun weird trivia that I learned building Hatchbox. That is really cool to know. I don't know that I'll ever like <laughs> reference this ever again, but I'm glad to know it. Yeah, the, these are the little things that are like, you know, things I was forced to learn building Hatchbox that I would be happy to never have had to learn. But <laughs> here we are. <laughs> All right, we're on question eleven to thirty. Oh boy, this is gonna be a long episode. <laughs> what version? of Ruby introduce method chaining using the yield self method. So like 2.5? 2. 2. points. Good work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Maybe used that was yield really self crazy. the other day. Yeah? I, uh, I was writing a script. That script I was talking about last episode, I had a... Like refresh us on that one multiple csvs i had to mm. like so i had to give it a file name and so i said you i just took a string in the file name yield self which then had a block where i called uh like rails root join to get the actual like path and then i said yield self with that and then pass that into like csv for each or like csv parse and then did like yield self something else and then mapped it it was really fun huh interesting yeah i don't think i've had a use case for it just yet but it wasn't it you could use tap or something like that before yeah this was just an extra like more nicer wording or something yeah it it felt like they're not a an equal comparison but it kind of felt like the pipe operator and elixir a little bit uh, mm-hmm. the difference That's is like cool too. using the pipe operator will send like the first method or argument as the first argument to the next function it pipes into mm-hmm. where this mm-hmm. is like, it just yields a block. So you just take like the block variable and you have to manually do something with it, but it's cool. Gotcha. Yeah. That's super cool. I like that. All right. Next up. What is the estimated release date for Ruby 3.0? All you have to know is the year. And we talked about this on a recent episode. My memory is not that good. Uh, 2020? (laughs) Your memory is excellent. (laughs) Uh, I lost my place. (laughs) Sorry. We're going to start over. (laughs) Whoops. When you define a method at the top level, what class is that method called on? Uh, Kernel. (sighs) Object? Yes. (laughs) I good to remember. I, 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 every time you answer, I just second guess myself. <laughs> Wait, maybe it is. Yeah, I I can never remember. Um, one of the very first uh, um, Ruby conferences I went to, Ruby Midwest, the second talk of the day, like the first one was like Chris Wanstraff from GitHub, and then the second one went into like. Uh, Eigen classes and stuff, and my I remember having a headache after the second talk at that conference, and they were talking about kernel and a bunch of stuff, and I was like, "Oh my god, what is going on? <laughs> like this Ruby stuff is way over my head." <laughs> yeah, so I, I read it was object. I read somewhere else that it was like standard object, so I just went with object. That seemed. Mm, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I know. I I always remember like you know everything in Ruby is an object. I I couldn't remember about what kernel was and where where it fit in. I'll have to reread up on that. It's like useful whenever you need it, but if you're doing normal like Rails work, you almost never need it. Yep. So, all right. Well, we're at forty five minutes, so maybe we cut. If we can, the, can you like cut the audio clip halfway or whenever you're done? Yes. Now, that way we can get through this a little faster. <laughs> you got it, Chris. What is the standard Ruby interpreter often referred to as? MRI. Boom. 
What Ruby implementation was designed for enterprise environments and optimized for large scale Ruby on Rails apps? Was it the old Ruby Enterprise Edition? Re. <laughs> Is that still a thing? I don't. I really don't know. At one of my previous jobs, we used Re one eight seven in a legacy. Yeah, I was going to say all I remember was it was pre two point or something, but we would use it at uh, for hosting and production all the time, and I don't remember if it was free or not. And then I just think it was not maintained more or something. Yeah. I remember we had to like patch it ourselves. Yeah. That's some old school stuff. You already know the answer to this cause you've already said it and I should just not say it, but what web framework did Ruby on rails merge with for the release of rails three merged with Merb. Sorry. You said Mer, and I was like, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I, and that would be a fun one, too, is to uh, grab a copy of Merb before the merger. <laughs> that would be interesting to see. Did you say, what, did you, what word did you use there? Did you say merger? I said Merb before the merger. Oh, I thought you said <laughs> merger, and I was like, that's such a great use of <laughs> words, but it's not. It's, yeah. You didn't say it. Merger. <laughs> what is the name of the popular graphic novel used to introduce Ruby to developers? Oh, I know it's the one written by Wise. Yep. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. It's on the tip of my tongue. Wise Poignant Guide to Ruby. Yeah, Poignant Guide to Ruby. I'll give it to you. Uh, and not give it to you. Dang it. A lot of emotions there. What popular implementation of Ruby runs on the JVM? JRuby. What is the name of the upcoming or new and upcoming upcoming implementation of Ruby on the Growl? Growl? VM. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, Truffle Ruby. Shout out Chris Seaton. All good work he's doing. Mm-hmm. What year did Matt recently announce as a potential year for him to retire? I don't remember that one. You told me about that. 2025. Uh, 25. Okay. I got it. So we still got some time. It's just uh, like a guesstimate. Yeah. It'll be weird. It'll be really weird. Yeah. Don't want to think about it. Can methods be added to a struct? Yes. These are some of the ones I got from that GitHub repo. You can add methods to anything, right? Because uh, they're all objects. Like you can add method, like Active Support does, adds you know dot minutes to fix nums and stuff. So I think yes. Sorry, <laughs> what method is invoked when a method is not found? Method missing. You Ruby expert. That was a giveaway if you asked it. What happens if a method is missing? What method is called? (laughs) What happens when method missing is missing when a method is missing? (laughs) Like I tried to tee that one up for you and you still got it wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I've got got another one. (laughs) What method is invoked when a constant... Or a const is missing. <laughs> const missing? You're so smart. I don't even know if I've used that one. I think I have. My code like, ever. And like some horrible thing that no one should ever use it for. <laughs> what error is raised if a method is past the wrong number of arguments? Argument error? You got some tough ones. <laughs> Dude, you're you're nailing it though. What question number are we on? Uh we've got five more. Okay. We're rolling through it. What is the default encoding of MRI? Uh it's not UTF eight, is that right? The answer is the inverse of what you just said. 
It is UTF-8. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I couldn't remember. I looked that one up because I didn't know if that had changed since. Yeah. Because I, I kind of, well, maybe it's just the scripts that you write. Like you put the, there was, you know, those magic comments that sometimes you put at the top of files for like frozen string literal. I couldn't remember if that was one of the ones where you had to previously do UTF-8 or something in like Ruby 1, 1X. One I don't remember. So I just opened IRB, opened a string and did encoding and it came back UTF-8. So. Mm. And I know you can use emojis as variables. So yeah, that's right. That would, that would also mean that it would be UTF. Something. Shout out emojis as variables. You can also, fun fact, you can also change your host name on the Mac to a poop emoji and it will show up on everyone else's computer as a poop emoji. <laughs> <laughs> we we've been using uh like my son my two-year-old loves facetiming his grandparents but he's also found the like me emoji stuff or i can't remember what it's called and oh and emoji and emoji that dude loves making himself the poop face <laughs> yeah well you know when you're when you're young and when you're an adult poop jokes are still fun you got a poop mouth mr burgundy all right. <laughs> what? This is fun. Why must a module name begin with a capital letter? Uh, because they're constants. You are. You're rocking. Oh. Are constants public or private? Oh. Is the initialize method public or private by default? Uh, have to be public, right? It said it was private. Huh. Weird. Yeah. Blew my mind. Because, like, when when you override it, you usually do it, like, in a public space. Yeah. Maybe not what I've not actually thought about By the way, <laughs> I don't know that these are all right. They're right as best of my knowledge, so. <laughs> I made them up. That's fine. <laughs> in what year will Ruby yeah, take guess- over the world? 2019 <laughs> the linux it's like what year is linux on the desktop going to be the finally a winner <laughs> never <laughs> does a method return a value if it does not contain an, an expression uh still returns no nil correct it returns no but the question is is nil a value well i guess the answer is it nil an object? Yeah. So I guess actually the it's answer. Value. It, it always returns an object. Yeah, it returns a nil class whose parent class is class. <laughs> so that answered that one. And class's parent class is class. Exploding head emoji. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, that's like that that conference talk I mentioned. The guy showed a graph of like uh, the language hierarchy or something, and it was just like this circular hell of dependencies or something. And I, he was getting into crazy stuff like eigen classes, which I've never ever used, um, which is like a fascinating thing to read about. But I was like, when am I ever going to use that? We're on our last one. I need you to name one immutable object in Ruby. Uh, Hmm. I'm trying to think. There were two to choose from in the question I found. Hmm. Uh, Think of a value that we use that no matter what is always the same value. I mean, first thing I thought of was like true and false, but symbols is that? the one that symbol. Ah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a great yeah, one. You said symbols. Yeah. <laughs> what What was the other answer? Uh, I had to look it up. I didn't write it down because I was like, I didn't know for sure if that was true. I was like, but symbols, yes. Yeah, symbols make sense. I don't know that skipped my mind. Um. 
we've reached the end. Woohoo! And now, now you got me wondering what that other Here, I'll look it up. answer was. I got to look it up for show <laughs> notes anyway. Because I was like, I guess you probably could modify true and false, but I've never, uh, there's no reason you would ever want to do it that. It wasn't so. Boolean. Hold on. Yeah. Although, if you ever redefine true and false, like, you should be fired immediately. I just coughed so loud. Um, the other one it had it's okay. was... It's Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. The other one it had was Fix Numb. Fix but Numb, huh? didn't Fix Numb get put into integer? Yeah. I don't know. Huh. Symbols... Sounds like the right answer to me. Well, so the question it was, this is on this repo from 2013. It says symbols are immutable objects. So like, that's not a question. That's a statement. <laughs> Name another immutable core Ruby object. And I was like, well, I don't know if fixed num is still around, but symbols, I can just turn that into a question. Yeah, there you go. And you know how I you know that one for sure. This is how I feel about how well you did. <laughs> <laughs> we did it this was a fun episode <clears throat> this was fun and really long I'm really sorry <laughs> uh, it's about as long as our longest episode I think I think if we had to play the full audio clip the whole time we'd be at an hour and a half <laughs> maybe two hours <laughs> yeah maybe this is good I liked it you reminded me of uh, one time at a Ruby meetup, we did a uh, a game of is it a gem or is it made up or something like that. And it was like, you know, these weird gem names that we would find on Ruby gems. And we just like have you choose which one's the real gem and which one's not. And it was, you know, like stuff like cheeseburger or whatever. And you're like, I don't know. I feel like someone might have actually made a gem called cheeseburger. And, like, you'd be surprised sometimes. There were some hilarious gem names taken. That sounds like a fun one. We might have to play that game. Yeah, we should do more stuff like this. It was, I, like, actually, like, was forced to prepare, and it was fun. Yeah, you could even make this a keynote in RailsConf. That could be your your thing, your claim to fame. my, uh, my thing. Well, cool. This was fun. It was good. Yeah, man. Uh, Hope you uh, you have a good Christmas. I don't want to keep rambling for too long after all this fun we've had. Uh, but uh, I think we've got yeah. I think we've got a show booked for next week with a guest, and then the following week with a guest. Mm, nice. So yeah, I think it'll be great to have uh, more more interviews on the show. It's always fun to find out people's backgrounds and stuff. So I'm excited about. Sorry that. Sorry for all the heavy what breathing. If, I can't breathe through my nose. <laughs> it's all good it's not like you're recording a podcast or anything <sighs> luckily How gross is that <laughs> all right man have a good christmas good holiday <laughs> well you too we'll talk later